Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Reverend Hunter Podcast. This is Tony Jones. I'm the Reverend Hunter, and I am joined, as always, by Brandon. What's up, Brandon? Not much, man. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know, not much. Same old, same old. It's the, it's the typical Corona response. What have you been up to? Not much. How about you? <laughs> not much. I know, man. <laughs> Look, I don't know about you, but I am bored. Oh, I'm Are so you bored? bored? I mean, so bored. <laughs> so bored. It's the worst. I people are asking me like one of my brothers, okay, so I umpired baseball from age 14. I started umping girls slow pitch softball when I was 14, like 10-year-old girls, and I worked my way up till 2001. So when I was like uh, 33 or whatever, 33. Yeah. Um, is when I retired from umpiring and I worked my way up to division one college baseball. And that's what I was done. I was just done. And I, I had two little kids and I just couldn't be gone. Like, you know, you go umpire a double header at Northern Iowa or in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, you know, and you're gone for like 18 hours or whatever on a Saturday. And I just couldn't do that anymore. So I retired and I just started umpiring again. And my brother was like, doesn't it feel like a step backwards? Like, because I guess he was assuming I was doing it for the money. You know, oh, it's a hundred bucks a game or 120 bucks a game. And I'm like, dude, I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it because I'm so bored. (laughs) The money is just the the, the cherry on top. The, The killer of boredom is the reason. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the money barely pays for like the gear I had to buy and the gas for my truck to get to the games or whatever, but last night I did a town ball game in a 35 and over league in Dundas, Minnesota, which is straight south on 35, um just south of Northfield if people know where like Carlton and St. Olaf colleges are. It's the next next exit after Northfield. And it is a beautiful little ballpark um you know perfectly manicured and it was so fun i was just it it was just a great thing to do to get me out of the house to go do something fun i do love baseball um i don't know if these guys are passing me covid on the balls you know when they hand me the baseballs or whatever (laughs) but i don't know it's just something to do and Well, part of it too is actually getting to practice practice the art of a real human interaction and conversation. That's a good point. You know, something that that I I know it seems weird, but you actually feel like we've taken for granted all these years because I uh, bumped into some people the other day, socially distanced, and I didn't even know how to like (laughs) stand around them, be around them, and just have a real conversation. It was it's a totally different thing. It's crazy. Yeah, it is funny because, like, for instance, you you. After all the warm ups, the umpire meets at the at home plate with both the managers and you kind of run down the ground rules of the field and stuff like that. And of course the natural thing is that you shake hands, you know, and now you stand there like with your hands behind your back, hoping that n- neither of the managers sticks his hand out to shake hands. And you know, after the game, the teams like stand on the baselines and kind of like salute each other rather than going through a handshaking line, stuff like that. So there's some def- definitely some differences. Yeah, it's just a weird thing. So you had an interview with Barbara Brown Taylor. Tell yeah. me about her. I, she seems like such an interesting woman. My gosh, she's she's one of my favorite people on the planet, and I am not alone in that. She uh she has a you know fascinating journey, fascinating story. We talk about it in the conversation. She grew up not in a faithful Christian home, but converted to Christianity or started to take faith seriously in high school and then even more so in college. Um, after that, went to Yale Divinity School and was ultimately ordained as an Episcopal priest. She is a a writer. I think, I guess I would say she's a writer in the Southern tradition of great spiritual writers. Um, You know, the the South, especially kind of every uh, woman writer of faith in the South probably is, 
is, walks in the in the footsteps of Flannery O'Connor, and I'd say Barbara is in that same kind of orbit. Um, wow, you know it's funny she. I would say she's known for two things in particular. One is she makes every list of like the top 10 preachers in the world or the top 12 preachers in the United States or whatever. If you look her up, she's in a lot of those. um, She's on a lot of those lists. She's on every one of those lists. And it's because she really is. And I've heard her preach many times. She just is an extraordinary preacher and very different kind of preacher from me. She's, she's, she has a manuscript, a word for word manuscript, which in, in my estimation makes it sometimes harder to preach in a lively way, but she's an incredible preacher. Um, and then she's also this New York Times bestselling author. She she wrote a, a trilogy of memoirs, um, Leaving Church, An Altar in the World, and Learning to Walk in the Dark. She also has written a book called Holy Envy. That's her most recent book, which came out um, last year. And it was about, uh, her most recent book is about her, she taught uh, intro to like a religion survey course to undergrads. And so she learned a lot about other religions and taught her students about other religions. And they visited, they they would go into, she, she lives in Georgia and taught at a college in Georgia, but they would go into um, take field trips into Atlanta and visit a Hindu temple or Buddhist temple, um, things like that. So she just is a very graceful person. It was an incredible conversation. It really gets very intense toward the end of our hour talking to each other, um, talking about death, which seems to be a recurring theme on this podcast. But yeah, I, I think people will absolutely love it. And will fall in love with her if if they don't know of her before. But I'm guessing a lot of listeners have heard of her and will just think, yeah, this is why I love Barbara Ron Taylor. She's incredible, <laughs> wise and graceful and funny and everything. So, well, yeah, it's great to talk to you, Brandon. Uh, Always I, great to talk to you. Always. Nice. Yeah, and hang in there and st- stay sane. And um, <laughs> I'm 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 staying sane. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> good. And all you listeners out there, thanks for supporting the Reverend Hunter podcast. We would love for you to subscribe, rate, and review. And I really do think you will enjoy this conversation of mine with my dear friend, Barbara Brown Taylor. Barbara, my friend, thank you for coming on my podcast. I love being on your podcast, Tony, and that (laughs) chance to talk to you. Thank you. You know, it's funny because you said, um, I think we were talking a few months ago, and you were supposed to come up here to Minnesota for a writer's conference. And you said, I love podcasts. I would love to come on your podcast. What what kind of podcast do you love? Do you listen to them or do you like going on them? Uh, What I love is no video. What I love, because I'm an old radio person, (laughs) oh, yeah, I love no video. Um, Because as, you know, the other culture has taken off, I just find that interferes with the conversation so much. People want to know about books behind me or they get curious about what's on my cell phone. And with a, a conversation, I am paying attention to you as I would not if I had all uh-huh. kinds of visual distractions. So that's what I love about it. And and I love listening to them because it's a conversation in my ear and it, it feels like it's in it's happening in me and including me in ways that don't when it has to go out my eyes. Well, I think for a lot of us, it was surprising when it was revealed a few years ago that Terry Gross is never in the studio Yep. For with with her guest. Okay. And you've you've done fresh air several times, I know. Uh and she that's kind of what she says. She says the same thing. Like she can focus exclusively on what the guest is saying and not worry about you know facial expressions or something like that. Mm-hmm. Very old fashioned. And I find it very Yeah. Fun. Yeah. Well, I'm sure after this, after our time together, you'll say uh, Terry Gross is the second best interviewer in my career. You know, Tony, that's what I love is your confidence. <laughs> <laughs> but 
Barbara, I want to start by asking your advice because you're a farmer. Okay. Um, I have a cherry tree Uh oh. in my backyard, and I have already harvested three gallons of cherries. And I have made... Well, I gave two gallons of them to a pie maker, I know, and mm. she's making cherry pies. Mm. Um, I have made cherry rhubarb crisp. I have made uh, cherry galettes. I have made um, a, a cherry mint syrup, which makes an incredible cocktail. <laughs> and I'm looking out my back window right now at about one more gallon of cherries in the tree. They're all ripe. Today is the day. Wow. But I just am like, should I leave them for the birds or should I? It's really hard for me to see ripe fruit and not harvest it. Oh, so this might be more of um this may be more of a psychological investigation <laughs> the advice that I'm asking you for. No, it's Levitical. Should I yes, leave the yes. cherries? Yes, tell me. Should. Tell me. The, the Bible says so. The Bible says yeah. so. <laughs> in between all those other interesting things in Leviticus, you're um commanded to to remember the creatures who share that place with you or you can overnight them to me you know either way <laughs> tell us about your farm what's your farm like our farm out of i guess 175 acres only 2 acres is really an organic vegetable farm and the rest of it um, is intentionally left alone. It's mowed twice a year, just so I don't have to look at scrub brush for the rest of my natural life. But it's um, mm-hmm. it's the result of a two-year search in, in a rural county in Georgia, and I came here to be pastor of a church in Clarksville, Georgia, and my rule for land was no more than nine miles from the church. And my husband Ed's rule was running water. So it took two years to find a place that was the perfect, <laughs> okay. the perfect intersection uh, of those. And I mean, really, we walked onto the land. We'd been looking for two years. I looked at him and said, this is where we're going to live. And it's where we've lived since 1995. Now, why nine miles? Um, I don't know why, Tony. Maybe it's because I thought if I had a okay. okay. horse, that was as far as I, maybe I was being a contrarian. I don't know. And then, but see, soon also you get into other counties, and the church would have found that unacceptable. You have to live in the home county here. So, ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I hear you. I, um, speaking of Parsons on horseback, mm-hmm. my great great grandfather was a uh, Welsh Calvinistic Methodist pastor in southwestern Minnesota. New wow. Jerusalem Welsh Calvinistic Methodist Church, where he held services in Welsh. Wow. He was riding his horse the quarter mile from the parsonage to the church on a Sunday morning. Uh-oh. Uh, no, sorry. Sorry. He was walking when two men on horseback came across his path and asked him if he was a preacher. He said yes. Um. He, they asked him to preach a sermon. Hmm. He preached these two rough looking men a sermon as they sat on their horses. And then they uh, tried to offer him money at the end of his sermon and he refused. And it only, he only figured it out a couple days later when he was reading the newspaper that it was Frank and Jesse James. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> who had robbed the bank in Northfield mm-hmm. on the previous Thursday. Very famous, you know, it was, it was a famous robbery gone bad because most of the men in their gang and the James Younger gang were shot and killed or captured, but Frank and Jesse escaped. And uh, yeah, ran across my great great grandfather, and he preached him a little sermon. So, see, this is already the best podcast I've ever been on. So, that's already you've exceeded all that's previous a- hosts. <laughs> I don't have many good stories, but that's one of them. That's one of the few good stories I have. So, so you all, it's a working farm, but I mean, do you call it a hobby? You don't, you do, you don't sell produce. You 
ra- raise stuff for yourself? I mean, do you? Oh no, we're certified Georgia organic. You mow, I mean, you mow cert- the big fields. No, it's um, it's okay. arduous to keep certified um, organic you know, mm. sheets of paper framed mm-hmm. on your wall. So every year if someone comes here and goes through all of our records, we have to have the entire lineages of all the seeds, where they came from, you know, certify nothing's been sprayed mm. near them. I mean, it, that we haven't used boards with arsenic in them. So it's a working farm. And for many years, we sold at the Atlanta farmer's market, the Peachtree Road farmer's market. And enjoyed relationships with some of the best chefs in Atlanta. So it was really wonderful to go to one of their restaurants and see things on the the menu that came from our place. Once there was a salad with 28 kinds Mm. of wild greens just plucked from a yard. (laughs) And we thought, why are we paying $28 for this? You know, (laughs) instead of getting it for free, (laughs) but, but, but no, we've, um, it's been a commercial garden ever since the beginning, I guess. Now we sell to local places and don't make the drive to Atlanta anymore. Also, the market's pretty shut down during the pandemic, but yeah. it's had a lot yeah. of life. We've done community-supported agriculture programs. Um, we've participated in um, f- farms-to-schools programs, getting um, fresh produce to kids in public schools. So it's been great fun. Do you... Uh, do- do you and Ed do all the work? Do you have do you have workers on the farm who are harvesting all that stuff from the garden? It's a one person farm. Ed does all the work or did all the work and now life has blessedly sent I mean, maybe three times in a row, a younger person who just shows up and says, I want to learn organic vegetable farming and that person becomes the the chief gardener. So not only does most of the labor and organizes other people who want to help. Um, but it's two acres is a, is a strenuous one person garden. Um, right now, because we're not doing much commercially, there are about five neighbors and friends who come over. We, I joke that we have a kind of Tolstoy commune going on here with all these interesting people <laughs> who show up and they all tend their rows. It's become an unofficial community garden, I guess, but everybody works. Everybody takes home produce. And it's um, it's just been a great way to wow, both great. be socially distant, but to feed and be fed not only by the vegetables, but by the people who come. I uh, my the rest of my day, the balance of my day will be first of all deciding whether or not to you know harvest these cherries, mm. uh, but then my garden is bursting, and today is a day of canning. Oh, all these vegetables! I'm going to have to pick a lot of zucchini. Oh God, huge zucchini and green beans. I've got some peas left and a lot of carrots and beets. And then I'm going to replant carrots and beets and try to get another harvest out of them. You know, my grandmother, uh, who out of that same lineage of the uh, of the preacher. She canned everything, and I remember going to her house, although she lived in town, um, she would drive around from farm to farm uh, trying to decide which cucumber she was going to buy to pickle. <laughs> uh, she was, she, and then she had, you know, uh, uh, in the, back in the day, she had the, a whole room in her basement that was, you know, the walls mm. were covered with jars and jars of vegetables and it was just completely lost my uh, my family i think there was something uh, in my grandparents uh generation where they felt like it was a great success to get off the farm and to stop having to grow things and butcher animals Mm -hmm. And so my neither my grandparents nor my parents did anything like that, and it's been I mean, other than my one grandma who canned, but it's been really a process for me to learn how, like for instance, how to butcher animals because mm-hmm. it had been lost, and I think you know it had been lost as like they considered a success that they mm-hmm. did not have to butcher animals, mm-hmm. uh, and now I'm I like I want to butcher animals. Mm-hmm. Uh, so is it's a funny thing to 
you, you you're from obvi- we're all from farming people. I assume you're from farming people since you're you have roots in South Dakota. Yes. I think I came from retail people, Tony. I wish I had stories like yours. I mean, I think, <laughs> <Is that right? laughs> I think they may have left the farming life when they immigrated, but um, but no, I wish I had okay. that history. I do know there's a place in Iowa, you know, that was the place that my um, great grandparents met, and and I have lost more of my history than you have. So you lost the butchering and had to recreate it, and I've lost you know, some of what my, what my people did, but you, you fill my head with the images of all that. I'm not in a part of the South where there's still a pig sticking every year, but you know, in South Georgia, that's still, I think a huge event on some farms that you, there's a pig Mm -hmm. annually who is, um, who's butchered and feeds the family for the year. So I've never been present at that. If I had to kill what I eat, I'd you know even carrots would be screaming probably. But but I am a great admirer. <laughs> I, I happily accept venison from a hunter on our property. I have about nine pounds now, so I'll swap you for the cherries. Oh, you probably have plenty of venison. Oh, nice. Yeah, I I've got a lot of venison. Although we've gone through a lot of it during the pandemic because yeah. we. Uh, you know, tr- are trying to avoid going to stores. And so we have a freezer full of meat and going through it. And mm-hmm. last night, dinner was elk given to me by my brother and some new potatoes mm-hmm. and some lettuce from our garden. Mm-hmm. And my son said, Dad, I could I could eat like this every night, just meat and potatoes. And I thought, <laughs> oh, you're... My, my dead father would... My dead father is cheering from his urn. <laughs> <laughs> His grandson just wants me in potatoes. I said, "Pour yourself a Jack Daniels, and you're you're my father incarnate, uh, re- resurrected." Oh my gosh! Um, tell me how you got from um, how you got from Yale to Georgia to a farm in Georgia. That must have been. I mean, I I know I've I've read your books. I was rereading one last night, and I want to get into that a little bit more, but. What was that journey? Because you you did allude in the book to there's a chapter in an altar in the world in which you talk about getting lost and and taking walks, kind of aimless walks. Mm-hmm. And you you um, also you know talk about the write about the the uh, taking. A, a journey in a career journey or a vocational journey that you didn't expect. You list a bunch of different jobs that you'd had before becoming a college professor. And you did say, you know, you had expected to be what a a pastor in new England and you ended up being a, a priest in Georgia. How, how did that come about? Yeah, I don't know um, that, yeah, but the, uh, it, you already tagged the South Dakotan roots on my father's side. On my mother's side, College Park, Georgia, which most people know now as Hartsfield Atlanta mm. Airport. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she she won every time we moved. My dad was an academic psychologist, and every time we moved, we moved further south. So I was born in Indiana because mm. he was getting a degree at Purdue. Um, and what I'm getting around to is I'm a Southerner. And when I got a fellowship to Yale following my graduation from Emory College in Atlanta, I just picked the most expensive seminary I could find, and it was Yale. So I went to, I thought when I got to Washington, D.C. in my little 99 sob that um, I was in the North. Mm. In Washington, D.C., I thought I was in the North. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I ended up living mm. in Connecticut for three years and loved it so much. I loved the books and the bookstores and the conversations and the poetry readings. And um, coming back south was difficult. So I went back to Yale and took a job raising money, at which I was a phenomenal failure. So long roundabout vocational path finally brought me back to the Diocese of Atlanta. And I I took about seven years, I guess, to do everything I needed to do to be ordained. And I think what you're remembering is I always thought I'd be a pastor. I just thought 
I'd be an Episcopal priest for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. But that changed in about 97 is when I moved to the college. So I have had never had a mm -hmm. vocational plan. Or if I did it, it failed. <laughs> so every everything I've done has been second or third thought. And that has worked out wonderfully, really. If only because I get mm. chastened and humiliated on a regular basis you know, basis and, and the world opens up to reveal other possibilities and, and those end up having things in them I hadn't expected. So, so it's been a good, good life. Mm -hmm. And my mm -hmm. last job I stayed at a long, long time. So I, I just give thanks at, at the way it's worked out, though it didn't work out in any way I planned. <laughs> when, when you, when you were ordained, was it still I, I know the obviously the Episcopal Church was really a forerunner in ordaining women, but was it still rare to be ordained as a woman or rare in the South to be ordained as an Episcopal priest as a woman? Yeah, but I should give a shout out. I mean, Quakers, Congregationalists, Salvation Army, all ordained women long, long, long before mainline Protestant um, denominations did. So I was ordained in 83. As deacon 84, as priest, mm -hmm. it's it, a two-step thing for the Episcopal Church. But I was second line. You know, the illegal, the Philadelphia um, women who were ordained irregularly, you know, by consecrated men bishops, sort of the way the Episcopal Church was created. You mm -hmm. got, you know, snuck over into Scotland and got Scottish bishops to ordain people in England and they were the first line. They're the ones who got really the hateful, hateful, hateful stuff. So by the time I came along, it was still very, very rare. When I came to Habersham County in 92, there wasn't a woman dentist, a woman lawyer, a woman anything. Mm. There might have been a woman accountant, but certainly no one in ordained ministry. So it was a really bold thing for the little church to do. And then you know, things changed drastically, and not just because the culture became more amenable to women. It was very economic, you know, that salaries in my part of the state are low and more and more men decided they could not um, support a family on the wages. So in my part of the world now, most Episcopal churches, I dare say, have got women rectors because the men are, you know, in bigger cities. So it, it has ended up being... Mm common here now, and it was very unusual 25 years ago. Now, in that first, paint us a little bit of a picture of that first parish. And did you wear a clerical collar when you were just walking around town in, in that first call? And I ask that because I'm, I'm from the Congregationalist tradition. We don't wear clerical collars uh, traditionally, we haven't. Although it's been interesting, Barbara, because some of my friends have um, begun to, like, for instance, I, <laughs> I won't reveal any names, but a very anti-clerical, uh, anti, I would even say anti-ordination friend of mine from the Emerging Church Movement texted me <laughs> about... <laughs> A month ago, and he was going to a protest, uh, a, a clergy protest and march in the wake of George Floyd's death, and he wanted to know if I had a clerical collar he could borrow. <laughs> and this is a guy <laughs> who has railed against all vestments for you know uh -huh. years, and now because he wants to be seen as a clergyman, uh -huh. uh, wanted to know if I had a clerical collar, which I didn't. But it must have been it, for a woman, If you, I'm asking it because if you did wear a clerical collar in that little town, it must have been quite shocking for some people to see a woman in a clerical collar. Oh, you've got, yeah, and that even happened in Atlanta because I served a church in Atlanta, oh. you know, before I came up here. But it, it was, it's funny how many people yeah, I mean, you're taking me way back. But in the beginning, I did wear a clerical collar around town, partly because I followed a, a famous guy whose baptized name was St. Julian Mustard Latchicott. And he was the, the youngest of uh, about 13 <laughs> children from um, Charleston, South Carolina. At any rate, he was a town figure. And to follow St. Julian in town, uh -huh. 
we finally shortened his name to Julian. They called him Louis Cator's kind of affectionately around town because he could he could mm. lift an eyebrow and, and look down his nose, but he was a fabulous guy. So if I was going to become the minister at the church he served, you know, that that lineage had to be done. But But it was interesting sometimes to be in a place where, well, most people assumed I was a nun. They thought that was a nun's outfit. And then once I was asked if mm. I was going to a Halloween party, which was odd since it was like May, <laughs> and I said no. But um, And then, you know, lots of people, I think, because I was a woman, didn't see the clerical collar. You know, you see what you expect to see. So I think a lot of people just saw yeah. um, that I had on a shirt with a white collar and did, didn't didn't notice. So those were, those were interesting times, but I... It, I never, I, you know, I never came in for any hostility. I mean, this is an, I picked this town on purpose and it's an odd town full of eccentrics and that's why I love it. Mm. So no meanness that I ever heard about. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, then you left the church and wrote a book about it. And I remember, you know, hearing you speak about it in those days. One of the... One of my first memories of you is that we spoke at the same event at the National Cathedral. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember this. I think it may have been the first time we met in person, possibly. And it was, it was, um, you know, it was kind of around Diana Butler Bass's book. But you, you and I spoke. Marcus Borg, Phyllis Tickle. Oh, I um, remember it vividly. And I had the miss. <laughs> I have the misfortune of uh, being at a book signing table next to you. They they had everybody, all the authors who were speaking at the conference uh, were, you know, paired up and had book signings. And they sat me down at a table next to you. And I, as my, my recollection of it is that there was not a single person in line to get me to sign a book, <laughs> but Tony, your Tony, line was... Tony blocks long tony uh, i was there and that's not true but you go you go ahead and 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 treasure that uh, that false memory <laughs> i think i'm pretty sure that's how it happened and i also remember being scolded by phyllis at that event because i was so livid after marcus borg's talk oh and the way he talked about people in the middle of the country. Yeah. And uh, I was sitting at a table of the entire staff from First United Methodist Church in Wichita, Kansas, mm -hmm. which was the most progressive church in Wichita, which meant it was still way to the right of, mm -hmm. you know, anybody on the coast. But it was as progressive as they dared be in Wichita. And the way Marcus Borg talked about uh, people in the center of the country and and things like you know you've mm -hmm. you, you heard him speak many times I know and but Phyllis looked at, I was livid and Phyllis looked at me and she said Tony M Mark Mark bugs the hell out of me too but I have met more people who are still Christians today because of Mark Borg mm -hmm. so so I have to you know I I have to continue to take him seriously but mm -hmm. those were interesting and heady days mm -hmm. for me being in you know in the in the emerging church movement whatever mm -hmm. but those were the very days that you were leaving parish ministry and i do know that some because i talked to people i mean i remember some people feeling somewhat betrayed by you um for here you are you know making these lists of greatest preachers on the planet and things like that and at the very time saying i'm i'm basically i'm leaving the pulpit to to become a professor um I, so i just wonder looking back now you know how do you reflect on how that all went in your your very public um departure from parish ministry well at least you got it right because i wrote the book and it's called leaving church and it doesn't have V in it, because so many people assumed that when I decided to leave parish ministry for what I might call classroom ministry, but, you know, they would write me about having left the church. And one one person even, you know, wrote and counseled me on my relationship with God. And I said, really, that seems okay. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, but it's a vocational 
change for me. So what I remember is some of what you say, I mean, first of all, the, you know, being recognized for what I did was the best reason of all to stop it. Because I think in my life, in some ways, I have always fled competence, you know, that when you start getting a rep for being good at something, it's going to go sour soon because you can't live up to your own reputation. And everybody who listens is going to be comparing you to the last time you talked or to whoever else is in the room. And I just got tired of that part. Um, and then anybody who reads Leaving Church will know there's, you know, a lot more going on than that. But anyway, the, the confidence piece was a good reason to mm -hmm. think about doing something different that I could be a beginner at and get back into learning mm -hmm. mode instead of, you know, competitive mode, even if I didn't sign up for the race. <laughs> um, and I do remember people getting mad at me and it was so odd because in some ways it was, it was what I also disliked so much about wearing the collar and being the rector of a church was the huge projection, you know, being asked to carry so much more than a, an individual life that was in pain at that time. But, you know, to be, I mean, I even had someone say to me something like, you know, you just wrecked the next generation of women clergy. I said, oh, really? I don't think I have that much power. <laughs> I don't think, that, I think that's a little Jeez. more than I can do all by myself. But it was the same kind of weird, oh, projection on, you know, the leader, the representative person. I, I didn't know. It didn't, it didn't feel fair, but... But that, that blew over. I lost, you know, two or three friends for good. Um, and then, and then ended up hearing from people in really interesting places who, who identify with a lot of what I'd written about, um, in the, in the book. Yeah. And, and it, it's a love story. I mean, I wanted to title it Leaving Church, a love story, but the editor, in fact, you and I have shared the editor said that would be misconstrued <laughs> as a, another, you know, Catholic priest leaves. <laughs> leaves the ministry to marry the woman he's always dreamed of. And he said they wouldn't even see that it was written by you. But so yeah. I, that, had, but it's a love story. I mean, that book is three quarters of why I fell in love with the little church I served here. And then also how that became very, very burdensome, largely because I wasn't a good leader. I didn't know how to take them to the next, the next stage. It's still the smallest church in town. You know, everybody else has, has grown in buildings and congregational size in the Episcopal Church here, and anybody who listens, you know it's true. It's the bonsai church. If it gets too big, you start lopping off the branches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, I wonder. I, yeah, um, I, yeah. Well, I just wonder. Do you think people will say say churches are closed for another six months? Say churches are closed for nine months, or maybe twelve months. Um. Do you think people will go back, or will people will congregants leave church and say, "I just haven't really missed it. Mm -hmm. um, I found other ways to connect with my church friends mm -hmm. and the church." You know, I, I I don't really miss the sermons. I don't really miss the music. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder about that. I wonder how many people will become just kind of socialized to doing other things with their Sunday mornings and not return mm -hmm. really will leave church. Well, and that's been going on for what, 50 years? I mean, you yeah. know, not not to dismiss this being a, an extremely unusual time, but I remember Will Williman talking about, you know, the day that bowling alleys opened in Alabama on a Sunday and people mm -hmm. found other things mm -hmm. to do with their yep. day once the culture stopped protecting, you know, the sacred day and not offering anything else for people to do. So, uh, so I don't, I, I, I didn't mean to dismiss the, the premise of the question, but you know, time will tell. I, I also have friends who've got like, you know, 200% increase in online attenders than they ever had in a, in a church building. So, it's a curious phenomenon, but but I I don't think things will be the same. I don't I don't think you know the numbers will will return, but it's possible new people will come, you know, who discovered it online and want to see what's going on in person. But what do you think? What do you think? Come on, you're the, I do you're wonder about futures. that. I mean, I I I do. I'm a terrible futurist. Mm -hmm. I I do. 
I see those numbers too, and I see churches who have online views, uh, you know, on their YouTube streaming or what, what, what have you, that are larger than their in-person congregations. The reason those are sometimes misleading, you know, is that you only have to log on mm-hmm. to a YouTube video for thirty seconds for it to be counted as a view, and mm-hmm. that doesn't, you know, you're not watching the whole hour-long liturgy. Uh, mm-hmm. You tune it. You can tune in and tune out, or fast forward. Um, oh, you, you know, could I've be watched shopping. a couple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I I talked to. I asked my mom. I said, "Have you been, you know, watching the live streams of the church service?" And she said, uh, "I did watch one a couple weeks ago. I just had it on in the background while I was doing a jigsaw puzzle." <laughs> which I <thought> was, <laughs> you know, I wonder how, how many people are doing that. And I, mm-hmm. I taught a Zoom confirmation class last Sunday, and you know, I can look at the screen and I can see that these fifteen-year-olds are looking at their phones. Yeah which are hidden from the screen, you know, they're not holding their phones up, but their eyes are averted and they're looking down, which I'm sure you, you know, you had similar experiences in your years of being a college professor of knowing that uh, these, you know, the kids with their laptops open, half of them are playing Minecraft mm-hmm. while, and, and not necessarily taking notes on your lecture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know. I, I wonder, and you know, I've I've in many ways left the church too, and I, you know, in some some ways, the reason I wanted to have you on the podcast here is so you could counsel me of how to do that well and gracefully. I I obviously left the have left the church under different circumstances than you. I left it more involuntarily, whereas you left it voluntarily. Um, but I've struggled at you know age fifty two to reshape and recraft a life and a vocation, having spent so many years, not only in training, you know, in mm-hmm. three years of seminary and a freaking decade to finish my PhD um, in the church world, but then you know twenty five years of building up a network and contacts and things mm-hmm. like that to see it all vaporize and then try to figure out, well, what do I do now with, with um, how do I find meaning in, or, or, or uh, let's see, how do I find a vocation in something that has meaning and that I love? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, I, you know, I wonder what, you obviously took to, and it doesn't knowing you, it doesn't surprise me that you took to um, teaching at the undergrad level and fell in love with those undergrads and and teaching them religion. But how did you, you know, how, I'm wondering how that transition went and what you learned or what mistakes you made and what kind of surprise successes you had when you made that vocational transition. Whoa. <laughs> no <laughs> i i'm again that was now a long time ago but the the short answer is it took a long time i mean i didn't even know how to dress in the morning i didn't know how to dress i didn't know how to talk i didn't know oh. how to be in a classroom instead of a sanctuary i didn't know how to use a podium instead of a pulpit i di- i didn't i didn't know any of it um, it occurs to me now with so many people reinventing themselves vocationally in other vocations. I mean, you know, not in ordained ministry at all, but just people I've loved whose, whose former work lives collapsed and they were called upon to develop new skills and, and find a new, you know, person in themselves asking all the questions you're asking, what can I do that I love? What can I do that I'm, you know, good at? How can I serve? It So it helped me a lot to not get too focused on my own situation, that I was in a, a community of people in a lot of vocations who were retooling. Maybe not a lot of people, but I had company. So I don't know. I think I, you know, we'd almost have to start at the beginning. I was not raised a church person. 
I was raised by, Mm -hmm. you know, an academic dad and a stay-at-home mom who were very suspicious of my wish to become a baptized Christian in high school. So in some ways, this is more of a return to normal than it is, you know, the the loss of a, a childhood that was active in churches with parents who were actively educating me at home to be a Christian and act like one. So, so I think, you know, the whole life j- journey may be different. Again, I don't know what you were doing when you were eight or, or 12, but were you were you i mean i can ask so were you raised in church yeah yeah mm-hmm. raised in a raised in a church that uh was founded by my grandparents mm-hmm. as well as um a, a bunch of other couples of course at the time all cis gendered hetero white mm-hmm. you know couples in a suburb of minneapolis Oh, see. Uh, founded a Congregationalist church. Yeah. See, this is And huge. then that church, yeah, that church didn't join the UCC because uh, that congregation thought that the synod, the synodical structure mm-hmm. that uh, was part of the union of the Congregationalist church and the German Evangelical and Reformed church was not truly congregational Mm -hmm. so they stayed independent congregational church in fact uh you may remember it because you spoke at that church many years ago you gave the gulick lectureship and you may remember at colonial church there's a little piece of the mayflower encased in a reliquary out in the common of the church i don't know if you remember that or not (laughs) oh no i remember it well yeah not a lot of yeah, not a lot of congregational churches with reliquaries, but that was, <laughs> we don't have the bone of a saint. We have a piece of the Mayflower. I love that. No, and I think you know Piedmont College, where I taught, was also a part of that movement, the one that decided not to become UCC. So we had the Mayflower. That's right. The Mayflower is still on the chapel spire in Demarest, Georgia, and the <laughs> and the dorms are named things like Falmouth and you know, <laughs> East Essex. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, so that heritage. Um, well, what's in, what's interesting about the, this congregation is that now I think, uh, from what I hear bubbling up, there is a real reckoning with this name, Colonial Church. Oh, because of you know the negative connotations around colonialism. Wow. Uh, so that will be an interesting thing to watch. So yeah, I did. Um, I did grow up in a church um, very much p- a part of my youth and then very early on articulated a call to ministry. So mm-hmm. this was another, you know, this has just been another thing of like, I I thought since I was in seventh grade, I was going to be a pastor. And now it's, you know, at age 52, it's clear I'm not going to be a pastor. So I, you know, well, this is part of this whole Reverend Hunter thing is I've found great joy in the things I do outdoors and I've I've really found God in that and it's I, I guess that you know this is something I see as such a theme of your work um, is the the two books that followed leaving church really were so much about finding God or I don't know how you say it now how do you say it do you say <laughs> Do you say finding the transcendent or finding the numinous or finding the divine? Like what? Outside of the church wall. So, you know, on a walk or in your garden or in your marriage, um, you've written so eloquently about all these things. But one of the things I'm wondering now is when you, outside of that church language, how do you refer to God? Do you, what, what kind of language do you use? Isn't that a great question? I remember going to some conference and I always ask about my audience and somebody said, well, you know, go easy with the word God, because that's a trigger word for a lot of people. I said, wait a minute, you're inviting (laughs) me to come talk, but I'm supposed to kind of work my way around (laughs) that word. That's really going to be a challenge. But But I do find, I mean, we could have a whole other conversation on code language, you know, and language we think uh, yeah. We're using in common and we're not. But the sacred, the divine, 
uh, work for me just fine. The transcendent, the luminous begins to get a little abstract, though they're not, there's nothing wrong with them. But mm-hmm. I still have maybe, you know, from my strong Christian formation, even though I chose it, my parents didn't choose it, um, a, a sense of both the vast universal kind of presence and a, and a personal one. So, you know, the the divine, the sacred, and then more and more, it probably only means something to Christians, but the spirit, I mean, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity has become my, my later in age go-to, <laughs> go, mm-hmm. go, go-to mm-hmm. face mm-hmm. of the sacred is, is the spirit. And I think that has a ton to do with living on the land, where sometimes I can see the clouds rise out of the valley in the mornings and become you know, go up into the sky and where the wind blows mm-hmm. the trees around. And so the spirit as wind and, and as bird, because I've got a pair of red-shouldered hawks on my place and they kill things I really like uh, in a terrible kind of collision a few years ago, there was a, a dove who had, uh, maybe it was a pigeon. It was like a messenger p- pigeon who got wounded here and I nursed him back to life. And then, and then the day I let him go, a hawk, swooped down and just took him. <laughs> I went, oh my God, what kind of symbolism is that? But, but if you live on a farm, you know, you can't be really romantic about nature. I was just reading some bit of Thomas Merton, you know, that outdoors where all creatures follow the will of God. And I thought, man, you can tell he lived in the woods of a monastery and not on a farm. He did not butcher his meat, I promise. Um, but, you know, to live on a farm is to... Uh, to experience the divine and the sacred and also to become familiar with words like sacrifice, you know, to give, to make something holy by giving it away for love or, or, or what it takes to live and, and looking all the way down the barrel in your case at, you know, what it takes to live that if you want to eat this, um, look into the eyes of the creature who gives you this life. And that's that's too too squeamish making for a lot of people. But though I don't butcher the meat here, I I certainly see life and death in a much clearer focus than I ever did on a quarter acre in a big city. Yeah, I've um I've in fact I've just been having an email back and forth with an old friend the the old organist of my church, a brilliant, brilliant musician who's since retired and moved south. Um, and he, you know, came across my work and basically said, I I really respect, I've respected you for many years. Um, however, I don't see how you can kill animals like this. You know, these are innocent creatures of God, and I don't know how you can, you know, hunt them down for sport and kill them. Hmm. You know, my response to that is always the same. And the first, you know, my first response is always the question, do you eat meat? Because if you eat meat, you're implicated in the killing of animals, Mm -hmm. whether or not you do the killing or you outsource that to, you know, somebody who works in a slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. Um, But people do have a real hard time with that and i i i wonder if you um when you think about that your connection to that land it's so important and you've lived there for so long how does the divine come to you in that i mean i guess i'm i'm trying to for myself i'm trying to parse out this difference between and and it's been a topic on the podcast in the past of the difference between pantheism and panentheism Mm -hmm. the difference between god being all things or you know the the tree being god as opposed to god being somehow other but infusing the divine into all these things or you know as uh jürgen moltmann writes about like the the love of the trinity overflowing that trinitarian relationship and absorbing all of creation into its itself into its bosom of love do you um i guess i'm just wondering both in your own experience of the land but also you've spent a lot of time looking at other religions and Mm -hmm. i wonder if you've learned from other religions 
in in your teaching of you know the the survey of world religions to undergrads and do they have you learned from another religion something about being in touch with the sacred in nature in a way that Christianity has missed hmm. sure and and Christianity well what's Christianity this huge umbrella and we act like it's one thing it's not one thing it's a lot of things but yeah um, you know, but also the presence of the divine or the sacred in the erotic, you know, or in, I can think of like a list we could make of ways that Christianities uh, have shied away from some of the places where the sacred is most available to tons of people, you know, who, who learn to censor themselves in church circles and to learn w- what one talks about and what one doesn't. But um, but but the nature piece, you know, I think because of Genesis and the mix-up of dominion with domination that Christians have taken an especially ruinous approach to creation. You've just said about 10 interesting mm-hmm. things in a row, though, and I don't know which one to go back and, <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> scoop up. But, uh, you know, going all the way back to the person who scolded you for um, – killing innocent creatures. And I will say I draw the line at trophy hunters because where I live every now and then I'll yeah. come across a perfectly good deer and all that's gone, you know, is the rack. And that just irritates the fool out of me. I mean, it, oh. stay off my land if you're a yeah. trophy hunter, you know, or people who, you know, who want to go other places because they have a study that's still missing a zebra head or, a, you know, something so 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 i draw a line too but but you know all the way back to this place and and especially pagan you know which if we look at the word means country person doesn't it someone from the countryside mm-hmm. i don't i don't all i know is this i'm i'm not a very good theologian but i know that if god is both in and beyond i.e. pan, you know, if if I am a panentheist and I believe God suffuses all that is and God is beyond all that is, guess what? I'm incarnate. And my only way of getting to the God who is beyond what is is through what is. So I'm kind of hopelessly pagan. I mean, I'm hopelessly, you know, straddling pantheism and panentheism. I mean, I, I certainly don't well, maybe I do say my prayers to trees. I talk to them all the time. I thank them all the time. The poor oak that just <laughs> fell. I just, I just am so sad, and I just tell it how brave it was and how much I appreciated its life. So I guess I talk to trees. Uh, but at any rate, I, I mean, where I would come down as Christian is I'm deeply incarnational, and that's the way the divine comes to me is through my body and my senses and rarely just through a little trap door in my brain or my mind, you know, where it comes in one side of the hemisphere and goes out the other one and never travels through any memory that involves my flesh. So I'm a skin on Christian. So that doesn't solve it theologically Mm -hmm. at all. But but I I think you know Caitlin Curtis, who just wrote a book called um, Native, and she was somewhere getting called out Mm -hmm. for being pagan. And she said, and I realized that really didn't bother me very much. It didn't bother me as much as the people who were calling me out for it. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But, but you know, people. I, I think people are lying if they tell you they aren't moved to tears by what happens in the created world. When the, when the roof over their yeah. head isn't there and the gas pedal under their foot isn't there and the cell phone battery has run out and it's, you know, night's coming on and they're, I mean, who's not? brought to primal realities by that so Mm. i am was that that was that uh you know i I would say like where you went to seminary is not known for its um deeply incarnational spirituality it's known for its you you know uh, very intellectual rational um teaching yale is known uh, to to turn out very bright, uh, well spoken, intelligent clergy and people who go on to get PhDs in theology and write incredible books, but it's it's a more rationalistic version of the faith. It ha- and yet I read your 
you know, your work, as you've just articulated so beautifully, is very incarnational. And, and it's, it, it's, has that been a, I guess, has that been a challenge for you to get out of your head and into your body and be a skin on Christian? Or was that, or, or was the study, the, the intellectual study of Christianity always out, outside of your norm? What, you, were you always drawn more to the incarnational? I was going to say, I just love it. You think I was ever in my head. <laughs> when I got to Yale, the first thing I noticed is my head did not work as well as other people's heads. So, uh, <laughs> so I don't, I, you know, I did, I did things. I mean, that was so long ago, Tony. But, you know, I, I got to Yale right after yeah. it had merged with Berkeley Divinity School, which is an Episcopal seminary. And I was not denominational when I went to seminary. I came out of a university okay. worship situation. But but since you had me thinking about those years, I think it was the total luck and grace of God that that's when I became attracted to the Episcopal Church, where the liturgy was so sensual. The, the brocade vestments were so mm-hmm. beautiful, and the all-male choir was so amazing. And we all, you know, hit the kneelers on our knees when we, you know, got to certain parts of the the liturgy and we all bowed at the way i mean it was like ballet i was looking at all this sacred ballet and incense and and then the episcopal priest there who ended up sponsoring me for confirmation was the first guy who taught me how to drink george dickel bourbon neat you know and we would sit in his study and he would <laughs> yeah. assign me the novels of charles williams and and then he'd go and cook duck in his kitchen and i made the mistake once of going back there and seeing his three cats sitting on the cutting board and thought oh hell i've been eating cat butt all this time and i didn't even know him but, <laughs> but, he, but he just ended up I mean, he was a brilliant guy, and he had a PhD in English and stuff. But I think something about him, St. David Bolton, and he he affected way more people than me. But he was my, that in the Episcopal Church at that time, in a high Anglo-Catholic church, who would have thought, ended up being the, the sen- yeah. sen- sense, I don't sensual is the right word or the wrong word, but anyhow, the, the good companion to the... Um, to the honing of my intellect that was happening up the hill at the Divinity School. And, and I mm. think that influx of Episcopal professors and students into Yale in those years had something to do with all of that. But David really did. David was a down-to-earth guy, and he was not fussy and not prissy and, and never let his intellect <laughs> keep him out of his skin. So thank God for him. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Before before my final question for you, I I do have a funny little Phyllis Tickle story to relate, and that is that um you know she she was a great fan of Jack Daniels obviously, <laughs> and drank it nightly. Uh huh. I'm sure you drank Jack Daniels with her. I drank Jack Daniels with her. <laughs> yeah, we I were learned at a George bar Dickel in was the not Twin the, Cities, yeah. a very kind. Of- uh oh. Yeah. Well, this is the it, 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 we were at this very hoity-toity kind of bar where you know it's hipster dudes with waxed mustaches, um, <laughs> and sh- and shirt sleeve garters uh, mixing up sixteen dollar cocktails. And Phyllis said, "Well, I'll have a Jack Daniels." And uh, the guy said, "Oh, you know." He looked down his nose at at this seventy five year old woman and said, "Oh, we don't. You know, we don't." stock jack daniels uh-huh. our our rail whiskey is dickel george dickel oh and she said oh i'm and here we go barbara phyllis says oh i'm related to the dickels <laughs> <laughs> the dickels and the tickles came together and somehow at ellis island got two different variants of the last name but i'm yeah pour me a dickel i'm related to the dickels <laughs> my goodness i never of course tickle and dickel yeah Phyllis she never... was related to them. She said some s- sibilant thing that happened at Ellis Island. Yeah. The woman continues that? to show me new dimensions of everything, even after her going on. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Same, same with me. I, I had, well, I had a very, I had a, I had a very, um, in, in the midst of my doubt and my own personal trauma, I had a very, intense spiritual experience when phyllis died and Mm -hmm. that was and it's hard to hard to articulate 
but I, th- I just thought to myself, in spite of my doubts, I don't think that that 80 years on this plane of existence if, is enough for that that force that energy of Phyllis Tickle. There must my point being I I just had this realization or awareness there must be something more because this life was not enough to contain the mm-hmm. energy of Phyllis Tickle. Mm-hmm. There must she must live on mm-hmm. in some form or fashion. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, that for for what it's worth. But she does continue to teach me from beyond the grave. Well, and uh, it, for, it's worth a lot. And and let me say that in my personal fantasies, a bell just rang where she is, and she knows we're talking about her. A bell just rang. Oh, I love it. Um, you and I have a shared love of the Gunflint Trail, mm-hmm. and I wonder if you could tell me just a little bit about your experience up there, because we have this shared spot in Minnesota that's really meaningful to me. In fact, uh, I will tell you that I know you stay at the Gunflint Lodge annually, and I, I'd love to hear you talk about that a bit, because um, I had been up the Gunflint Trail. I think I had been up there as a younger person. I went there with my children right in the absolute thick of the divorce Mm. and stayed at Gunflint Lodge, Mm. just a single dad uh, with three kids in a little cabin Mm. that had, um, I think, a toilet but no shower. They had just built these little out buildings we rented a we got I I think I bought it on a Groupon (laughs) and we got four hours of a boat rental and caught a fish and got caught in just an absolutely intense storm when we were out on the lake that came whipping down the lake and barely made it back um, to the dock so very I have these very vivid memories that are very very trying time in my life and have since been up the Gunflint Trail many times in the, you know, decades since then. Um, but it's a special place to me and I'd love to hear you reflect on it. I know it's a special place to you as well. Oh, and I, I, the only correction to the record is I've been once, which means it's so vivid. Oh, for is that me. right? Okay. I've been one time. I okay. went on the recommendation of a friend who's gone there for decades and when he learned that my husband, Ed, has long been drawn to the boundary waters, but I put him off until we could no longer have to carry canoes on our heads to go there. So I waited till right. he was old enough that we could rent a cabin instead. <laughs> so we went on the recommendation of a friend, and it's, it's, as, it's as you describe, and of course, completely different from what you describe. But I think you just made an earlier point, and, and that is the way... The place itself is spiritual direction a terrible word for your listeners, but the place itself no please no please is is is, yeah. is a spiritual director the place itself and um you know coming from the deep south humid muggy buggy south just to come into the clarity of that air right on the border um was remarkable. And the sunsets were remarkable, and and the waterfowl were remarkable, and me with my skinny old—I'm not even going to say how old arms, you know—paddling a kayak out, <laughs> and just lying there <laughs> with the loons starting mm. to come out at night. Golly, you've got me remembering the sounds as much as the sights. But mm-hmm. it was it was deeply deeply redemptive, and I wasn't wounded at that point, you know, any more than a human being is Mm. wounded. But that in my later age is the experience of the sacred for me. I I don't know how to say it well. I should have practiced before you and I talked. But the closer I get from my dust returning to dust, the more I feel held and destroyed, you know, by the earth or or not destroyed by it, but I know my destruction will bring me into it in some, and won't even be me anymore. At any rate, there's, there was something about the water and the sunset and the immersion in the, in the 
natural beauty and physicality of that place that soothed my soul way, way, way down. So I hope your children remember that vividly. I wonder what they remember about that. You may have to wait to find Boy, out. Boy, they have vivid memories. They have vivid memories of yeah. that of that weekend. It was, I think, a Labor Day, Memorial Day or Labor Day weekend. They have vivid memories, particularly because, as I'm sure has happened in your life, when you get caught in a gale mm. like we were, you know, we were uh, on the far side of Gunflint Lake in a little, you know, a little uh, aluminum fishing boat with a, I don't know, probably a 10 mm. or 15 horsepower outboard motor on the back. And this, you know, that's a long east-west lake. Mm -hmm. So the storm came from the east, which is... You know, we don't get that often in Minnesota, but a, the storm came from the east straight down the lake and the waves were two to three feet high white caps. And we were, you know, the boat would come up out of the wave and slap down on the next wave and the motor mm. would come out of the water and cavitate and you could hear mm. it, zzz, you know, mm. starving, uh, uh, the, you know, suffocating for water and... Um, mm. The kids were hanging on the gunnels for dear life. Oh, and, and I was father. scared shitless. I mean, yeah. I was just trying to drive into, like, in a zigzag fashion, drive into the waves because if we got, you know, sidelong to the waves, for sure a wave would have come up over uh, the gunnel and taken us down. Mm. Um, it was just one of those deals, and you, you, you make it back, and everybody hugs, and we. Mm. <laughs> Uh, we went inside and they took the lake trout that my son had caught and prepared it and served it to us in the mm. restaurant in in the lodge. Mm. Um, so it, yeah, extremely vivid memories. But I, oh my gosh, Barbara, I love this idea of the land as a spiritual director. Mm. And I think it should be your next book. <laughs> That's a great how, idea. How, how, it is a great idea. <laughs> it's mine. It's mine. <laughs> I mean, I want your. I you know, it's yours. Oh, it's yours. It's yours. I want. I want your benediction for me and for, mm -hmm. for anybody who's listening. How, how would we open ourselves? And I know this is just off the top of your head, but how do we open ourselves to the land as a spiritual director? How can I do that? I want to do that. Mm. I think all you have to do is want to do that, right? I mean, the minute you allow that idea, that notion, that possibility, I think the land will take it from there. And and because you and I have beautiful, wild places we go to, I, I want to hold out near the end that if anybody's listening to us who lives in a city, you've got three square feet of land somewhere you can get to. You know, mm -hmm. if you lean with your back against a tree, I'm thinking of Howard Thurman right now, you know, hugging a tree when he was eight years old and finding so much solace in that that he could not find, you know, in town because he was um, a brown kid. But uh, wherever you live, uh, the land is there waiting to be recognized and invited to teach mm. you what you most mm. need to know, whether it's scaring the shit out of you in a boat with your kids hanging on, or whether it's, you know, letting a squirrel drop a cracked nut on your head. It's an amazing thing <laughs> to open your soul and say, teach me. Mm. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. You're so welcome. Now I want to like stop recording and talk to you for another two hours. You got two more hours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony, so much. We There's so much recording. more. Really, I could have yes. talked to you forever. Thanks, it's it, it's just wonderful. And thank you for the ways in which it's a great um, joy. Well, and you are you are a pastor. You said earlier you're not a pastor anymore. I'll argue with you about that later. Okay. <laughs> Happy to argue with you anytime. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.